Greetings, friends. Welcome to our uh, weekly Bible reflection time. Next week is Holy Week, big, big, big deal for Christians, and uh, sort of the the biggest week of the year. And we have services all those days, and special prayers, and track what Jesus was doing the last week of his life. So I thought here a few days in advance, I would uh, record a Bible study about Jesus and Holy Week and uh, no one better to talk to about this or really any other topic than Amy Jo Levine. AJ, thank you for being with us again. Oh, it's my pleasure. I actually got asked, um, this is before COVID, doing a Bible study and there were some kids who came, the parents brought them. And I was talking about during Holy Week and one of the little kids looked up and said, were you there? <laughs> Well, I'm, you know, I'm old, but not quite that old. That is uh, too funny. Too, too <laughs> funny. It's like the old church, the old kids in my church, and they ask their parents, is he God? <laughs> yeah, most assuredly not. Yeah. But you could Anyhow. say child of, that would be fine. Yeah. So, uh, so Holy Week. Uh, it occurs to me, uh, talking to you, AJ, you, if people don't know, you and I were in school together doing doctorates and Bible uh, years ago way back. And in some ways, you, you and I do different things. I'm a pastor, you're an academic, but we, we both have tried to do what we're doing right now, which is to take academic stuff and to bring it into play for uh, people who don't have to have PhDs in religion to understand it. And you've, you've, you've done this forever. And you, you even have a little book on Holy Week, Entering the Passion of Jesus. I think some of our groups are using this. So that's interesting. I have a question before we start that. Though. Do you, so writing being Jewish, writing on something like Holy Week, do you ever get pushback? Like, who are you to talk about Holy Week and Good Friday? Do you ever get yeah, that? Anyway? Rarely, rarely. Um, every, you know, every once in a while, an Amazon review comes out and says, she's an unregenerate Jew. And what is she doing talking about the New Testament? Because you can't understand the New Testament without worshiping Jesus. And I'm thinking, well, no, that's yeah. really not quite right. Um, so yeah. I, I, my mother once described this as, it's better to be an infidel than an apostate. So I was never a Christian. I, I, you know, I, I think Jesus is fabulous. I've spent my life studying him. I've spent my life studying the Gospels. Yeah. Uh, but I've never felt that that kind of pull, whatever that is, that vocation, that calling. I've always just felt entirely fulfilled within my own Jewish identity. I just happened to find Jesus and his followers really interesting. Um, so it's not like I was a Christian and then somehow lost my faith and wandered off into atheism. Um, yeah. So at least for most people, what I can do is say, you know, you think Jesus is interesting because he's your Lord and Savior. I can tell you why people followed him in the first place before he died, because yeah. um, I, I can see that I can see why his message is so compelling and why he's so fascinating and so charismatic. Yeah. So Holy Week, Jesus, he detracted a following over time and he he's journeyed far north, Caesarea Philippi, wherever. And then he's gradually made his way south through Jericho. And he finally comes to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And uh, I had the great privilege uh, a few months back. I have a, a guy in the church. He is a close friend of Tim Rice, who is the lyricist yeah. for Jesus Christ Superstar. And he did a podcast with me. It was great fun. And uh, I asked him, but he wrote this song, Hosanna, Hey, Zanna, Zanna, Zanna. Zanna, Zanna oh, in, yeah. The crowd's excited. And they say, won't you smile at me? Won't you fight for me? Won't you die for me? I mean, Tim was on to something there. What, what is Palm Sunday? Jesus comes in. We, we made a cue about children and so on. But well, what was Palm Sunday? Yeah. Or depending upon how you do the gospel chronology, Palm Monday. But it you know, uh, doesn't work knows, quite as well. Right. Um, so we have this this image of what we might call the triumphal entry. Yeah. But what becomes more interesting to me is how the different gospel writers explain this. Because in Luke, for example, the only people who are doing any sort of hosannaing um, are Jesus' followers. In Jerusalem, the entire city is like, what is this? Not so sure. Um, so is it a triumphal entry or is it propaganda? Um, who is hosannaing? Um, is the crowd welcoming him? Is the crowd curious? Is the crowd thinking, oh, this is like the last thing we need because Jerusalem at the time of Passover, the pilgrimage festival, Pilate is bringing his soldiers in from Caesarea into the city. Uh, the place is like a powder keg and Jews are celebrating the Feast of Freedom with Roman presence there. You know, you bringing somebody in who's being hailed by the crowd as a king, that's difficult. So when we start thinking about the triumphal entry, first of all, we have to figure out who's doing it. And second of all, and this is what hits me on this, 
at least in Mark, you have the crowds hailing Jesus coming in. Everything is terrific. And within a week, he's dying on a cross. What so shifts? Um, was it a really big deal? And that's how he came to Pilate's attention. That would make sense to me. Um, was it uh, was it Jesus claiming the city and hoping that the city would convert? Or did he already know that that was hopeless? Did he already know that the only thing that he could possibly do is somehow go to the temple and talk about what the temple should be and mm. then die? Depends upon the gospel you read. Oh, I love the, uh, I think I knew this, but forgot about it. Uh, John Dominic Crossan wrote about uh, Jesus is coming in uh, from the Mount of Olives. So he's coming in from the east at the same time that Pontius Pilate is bringing these regiments in from the west, Caesarea. And they're, they're sort of conflicting versions of how you enter. Uh, yeah, you know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus comes on a donkey, right? It's not like Alexander on Bucephalus or something like that. Oh, yeah. On the other hand, Solomon came in on a donkey too. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, yeah. so don't take that donkey for granted or the two donkeys in Matthew for that matter, which is just a little odd. Um, I, I like the idea. I, I find it rhetorically interesting that you have Pilate, Pilate coming in with his guys on the one side and Jesus coming in with his guys on the other. It probably didn't happen that way. Um, and it's not clear to me that Jesus' major concern is the Roman Empire. So all of these folks who want to take like an anti-imperialist, anti-Roman anti view and look at Jesus as a kind of proto-zealot, I don't think that's quite the focus. I don't think the focus is Rome so much as that, that the justice of God is breaking in, and that applies to everybody. You know, and what uh, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you, what was on Jesus' mind as he came in? I, I'm reminded of this guy. I did a uh, class recently on Howard Thurman. And Howard Thurman wrote this just lovely thing where he said, I wonder what was at work in the mind of Jesus as he jogged along on the back of that faithful donkey. Perhaps his mind was the scenes of childhood, feeling the sawdust between his toes and his father's shop. He may have been thinking of his mother, how deeply he loved her, how many wished that there had not been laid upon him this great necessity. I mean, this is a lovely thing. What was on Jesus' mind? He, he, he's doing something deliberate, by, isn't he? By coming in in this way, drawing mm -hmm. attention to himself. You said he's coming in to go to the temple to say, here's what this is supposed to be. I mean, is that what his symbolic action is there? Um, there are a host, getting back into Jesus' mind is really difficult because all we've got is what's refracted from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we rarely get interior monologues, not like Marcia. Mark says to us, Jesus was thinking as he was riding the donkey yeah. into the city. I mean, we, don't, we don't have that, that sense of internal dialogue. Um, but we do have a number of motifs that seem to coalesce with Jerusalem. Um, there is the concern for the temple, which had been there the entire time. Um, my, the, the temple is my father's house. Uh, the temple is in the holy city, right? So father's house is, is Luke and John, and then holy city is Matthew. So I think there's a real strong temple focus. Um, there's a real strong David focus, King David focus. Um, so what happens when all this comes together? Well, there's also an idea of some sort of eschatological temple that the people at Qumran, the ones who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, were interested in, that's hinted at in the prophet Ezekiel, that the son of David, who was Solomon, is supposed to build. I'm right now reading a really nice book by Michael Barber on the temple in Matthew and how that functions and how all that temple motif comes together. Um, so I think there's a concern for claiming the temple, but also saying we're coming to the end of the temple as we know it. I do think he predicted the destruction of the temple, and he was not the only one to have done so. Because when the kingdom of God breaks in, and boy, he's talking about the kingdom of God, there's a brand new temple. And I think he's thinking that he's part of the one to build it, to construct it. It's, uh, yeah, that's, that's well said, AJ. So let's go to Holy Monday, or who knows what day it was, right? We're not sure about that. So this cleansing of the temple... When you and I were in school, I don't know why I remember this. I read something from a guy named Ellis Rifkin that I don't know anything else about, except he raised the question, not why did Jesus die, but why did they kill him? If you ask mm -hmm. the average Christian, why did Jesus die? They say, for our sins. If you say, why mm -hmm. did they kill him? You don't say, for our sins, right? So Jesus comes in and he cleanses the temple. This is amazing. And some church people think like, this is Jesus' memo against uh, church fundraisers. And that's not what this is about. <laughs> What's Jesus doing? He comes in and he really, create, really creates a ruckus. 
Well, it depends upon how you image the temple. I think it was Ed Sanders who famously said that the temple is like nine soccer fields put end to end. I mean, the place is huge. Yes. Um, so if you knock over a couple of tables over here, the people, you know, 20 feet away may notice, but you go, so what? So it's got to be some sort of symbolic act. Um, and, and in Mark, which is probably our earliest version of this, it's not just the money changers. That's Hollywood, where you get like the, the gold coins in slow motion falling to the ground and, and hook-nosed Jews going, my money, my money, um, <laughs> like Shylock. Um, I, I think he's really trying to stop business. You're laughing, this, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to say, wait a minute. And he will, after this, in Mark chapter 13, predict the destruction of the temple. He's trying to stop business and say, wait a minute, you got to pay attention to something else at the moment. Part of our problem is we don't know what he said or when he did this. According to the Gospel of John, the temple incident is in chapter two. He turns water into wine at Cana. Oh, suddenly he's in the temple. Oh, suddenly he's back in Galilee um, after a chat with Nicodemus. Um, in Matthew, Mark and Luke, assuming Mark is the earliest version, he comes in by quoting Isaiah and then quoting Jeremiah. Uh, my temple shall be a house of prayer for all nations. Well, it already was, because the outer court, which Herod built, is the court of the Gentiles, and Gentiles who are happily polytheistic will worship anybody. So you come to Israel, you worship Israel's God. If you make a donation, so much the better. Um, so it already was a house of prayer for all nations. Den of robbers is Jeremiah. And what I think's going on here, and it wouldn't surprise me if Jesus said something like this, a den of robbers is not where robbers rob. A den of robbers is where robbers go after they've robbed to count up their loot. Um, so think like a, a lion's den, right? Lions don't kill in their den. They kill outside and then they bring the carcass in and divvy it up. Huh. Um, so a den of robbers is a place where robbers feel safe. The modern version would be uh -huh. if, if during the work week you're a loan shark or you're a pimp or you're an insider trader um, and in various other careers that you can drop in here. Um, and, and you do things that, that distort community um, and disrupt community. And then on Sunday morning, you happily come into church and you drop a $50 bill on the collection plate and you think everything is peachy between you and God. It makes the church a den of robbers. It's a place where robbers feel safe. So people thinking of the temple is working on automatic, not actually having a transformation in their hearts. Perhaps thinking that there's something violent going on with the priests, but that's that's difficult to tell. Um I, mean, I don't is, is this why they killed him or was it the accumulation of all of these things? Oh, I, it's, I, I don't think it's that. I mean, the whole thing is weird, right? Because he goes in, he does this temple disruption. I don't think the term cleansing is very helpful here. That no. reminds me of like, you know, washing your floor. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a disruption of the, of the of temple. And then the next day he's there teaching. Yeah. You know, I mean, if he's that disruptive, why would they let him back in? It's not like all Jews look alike. Right. So they would have known who he was. So, again, I'm not so sure how big this thing is. It's big in, in cultural imagination. It's certainly huge in Hollywood. But historically, I don't know. I think um, that they killed him because he's dis he, he's a threat to the safety of the city. Um, although many people look at the Gospel of John as some sort of spiritual rather than historical gospel, I think John gets a lot of stuff historically right. Yeah. And Caiaphas says, you know, if we let him go on like this, this is following the raising of Lazarus. If we let him go on like this, then people are going to follow him. And then the Romans are going to come and destroy our holy place in our nation. Right. So what the crowd thinks he's a king, the triumphal entry has this kind of kingy suggestion, even if Luke's right in Jerusalem wasn't real happy about this. And Pilate's there thinking the last thing I need is a popular leader teaching in the temple, because if he says, OK, time for Romans to go away. He's got the crowd on his side. So in the same way that, uh, what's his name, Herod Antipas, right, the Tetrarch up, up in Galilee, um, engages in a preemptive strike against John the Baptist, right, lest the, he lead the crowd into revolt. That's what Josephus tells us. I think Pilate's doing a preemptive strike against Jesus. I don't think that Pilate or anybody else thought that Jesus was violent, because otherwise they would have shut him down immediately. No. Or, as my friend Paula Fredrickson has pointed out, if they thought he was a real violent problem, they would have arrested all of his buddies and killed them as well. You know, they just kill him because of the fear that he would lead the crowds into revolt. So he comes back uh, the next day, and we, you, we could spend four sessions just on this. He teaches for a very long time. In Matthew, I counted the verses at one time, hundreds of verses. He goes on and on and on. Some of our favorite Jesus things. 
You shall love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's, the mm-hmm. widow's might. A lot of this stuff is presented as Jesus' teaching on that, that Holy Tuesday. Is there any item in that that really stands out for you that's especially um, alluring, intriguing? Oh, what isn't alluring and intriguing? Yeah. It's it's all fabulous. In the, I mean, just sort of as one-offs, when when he says, um, you know, give to Caesar things that belong to Caesar's, and give to God what's God's. He doesn't answer the question. You know, does anything belong to Caesar? Does everything belong to you? Know, it's like make up your own mind. I'm not going to sort this one out for you. It's a brilliant answer. It's a non-answer, but it's a brilliant one. And it's um, not a, a, a his decree on the separation of church and state for no. sure. Yeah. Now, well, like he thinks the world is going to end. Why are we worried about church state things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, why are we worried about whose wife is this particular woman in the resurrection? Because God's the God of the living rather than the God of the dead, which is a great non-answer. Um, it is, however, a pastoral problem for multiply married people who are wondering what happens in the resurrection. And to come up with that kind of platitude that says your love is so all embracing that everybody feels exactly that sort of love is not always very satisfactory to a person who still wants a physical relationship with the spouse who has died. So this is a part where we have to start thinking about what do we imagine? Um, here's where the Jewish tradition says, don't don't worry, don't worry about that. That's not your problem. <laughs> Just worry about getting through the next day. Um, I, I've written substantially on the story of the widow's might, which is in Mark and Luke. It's not in Matthew. Um, or the widows might not, um, because the story is, is so often used to say how the temple was was economically exploitative, um, and what Jesus was doing by turning over the tables of the money changers and by by lamenting the widows might, although I'm not sure he laments it, that he's he's protesting um, the Jewish temple economic exploitation because Jews suck money out of you, and and so this story becomes uh, deployed in a very anti-Jewish way, and I don't think that's the case. Um, what the Greek says about this widow is she gave her whole she gave her whole life, not everything she had to live on. That's the NRS. She gave her whole life, which is exactly what Jesus has asked his followers to do. Right? Um, so everybody gives proportionally. She gives everything. At the same time, she could have relied on the temple for support because the temple also helped people who were poor. So granting that the chronology is a little bit uncertain, we we come to Holy Wednesday. I'm preaching on Holy Wednesday this year in Nashville for Upper Room. They have a service. I'm thinking, what am I going to say on Holy Wednesday? Because there are two basic chronology things. One is like, we don't know what happened that day, which is going to be my approach. Like nothing happened. Maybe he just chilled at home with Mary and Martha. Who knows? Or the other thing is that you have what, what you call the first supper, this anointing of Jesus. That's one of the most marvelous and probably misunderstood moments in all of the Gospels. Talk about that. Yeah, it's also one of my favorite stories. Um, So my my more conservative and fundamentalist friends say that women were just in the business of anointing Jesus, right? So you get some a woman who anoints him on his head at the beginning of Holy Week. And then Luke has a story about a woman up in Galilee who anoints him on his feet while he's reclining at dinner at a Pharisee's house. And then John splits the difference by locating this anointing during Holy Week. But now it's Mary, the sister of Martha, and we're back to the feet. So when did it happen? On what part of the body was it? I think it's the same story. Um, and I think Mark gives us the, the basic kernel of this story where Jesus is dining. It's not even clear that he's with his disciples, just people around the table. And this woman comes in and anoints him. Now, here's the question. She never says anything. Um, and then to use contemporary language, Jesus mansplains what she's doing. Right? So she uses this extremely expensive perfume. And people there are saying, hey, you could have used up her. You could have sold this stuff and then fed a family of four for a couple of months. right? So why are you using like Chanel um, on Jesus? He, uh, he doesn't need it. Um, and Jesus, Jesus mansplains. He says, no, she has anointed me for my burial. You'll always have the poor with you, which is a line from Deuteronomy. The next line is, therefore, extend your hand to the poor and needy. So everybody knows that. But I think in this special moment, every once in a while, you do something lavish and something extravagant because you need that. And boy, Jesus Jesus is going to die, and he knows he's going to die. And then for him, somebody finally, after he's been giving and giving and giving and giving, somebody finally gives to him. 
that's so important for clergy, especially who give and give. I mean, I'm not sure you want to preach this because then they'll have to. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, who give and give and say, sometimes you need to take for yourself. And if somebody get, does something for you that's extravagant as a one off, boy, go celebrate that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in. Uh... Of course, uh, in a couple of the verses, Judas complains, they should have given it to the poor. We're always saying what somebody else should do for the poor. And in Jesus Christ Superstar, Mary Magdalene says, one of the hit numbers, I don't know how to love him as she's tending to him. So uh, my two favorite, e two of my three favorite evenings of the church year, Ash Wednesday is one, but the other two are um, Maundy Thursday and Good Friday. We have well-attended services and people come. So so let me get you get, just tee you up to talk about sort of that set of two nights. Uh, you have the the Thursday, the meal is at a Passover, the foot washing. Jesus goes out. Uh, I love, by the way, um, the accounts of the Last Supper. It says that they sang. I just love that. Like the, these men gathered and the. They sing. Like, what do their voices sound like? Does somebody do harmony? Did Jesus leave? Does he have tenor? And it, it, is interesting things to me. Then he goes out to Gethsemane and prays this agonizing prayer. He's arrested. There are charges. And then he's by the next day, he's dead. Yeah. And, and you've written also on just on Good Friday and what that means. So there's, walk, there's walk so us through many. that amazing 24 hours. There's so much going on there. And what's going on substantially depends upon what gospel you read. So when you read Mark, it's a tragedy. It's an agony. Um, uh, Judas will betray him. He knows that. Um, he he leads the the James, John, and Peter to Gethsemane, and he says, "Stay awake with me, please." And he finds them asleep, and he asks them again, and they're asleep. Um, and finally, he's arrested, and and the disciples forsake him and flee. And that's that's the last time we see the disciples, other than that shot of Peter in the high priest's courtyard denying Jesus three times before the rooster crows. It's a tragedy, and the tragedy continues when Jesus is mocked by everybody at the cross, including the other two people crucified with him uh, and the chief priests who were there who aren't supposed to be there and the soldiers. And then finally he feels this absence of God. It's a tragedy. None of that in John there, there's no agony because, and there's no, my God, why, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in the gospel of John, Jesus and the father are one. So it would be impossible for him to think that God has forsaken him because they're so, tightly connected. And, and in John, Jesus orchestrates everything. So this is a question about how people want to imagine Jesus. Do you want to imagine him suffering or do you want to imagine him so strong that not only does he overcome suffering himself, he comforts the people who are there at the cross. Hmm. So he deals with their suffering. How do you want to take this? So here's this other thing that I'm wondering about, because I'm wondering about this, this supper, like who's there? Um, and I really like those various pictures that have women at the supper too. So here's a little hint that Mark gives us I like this. Uh, when the women go to the tomb in Mark and they meet this young man dressed in white, if you're dressed in white, you're probably an angelist or, you know, or you're really, really rich because it's hard to keep stuff white. I, I, I dress on white every Sunday morning. So I must be an angel. There you are. You, you must be. And who knows, you could be entertaining angels in disguise. Wow. Um, Pistol to the Hebrews. So um, <clears throat> these angels or whoever is, this young man says to them, don't you remember when he said to you that after he died, he will go before you into Galilee? Well, when did he say that? Ah. It's when he left the supper and he's going to Galilee. Ah. So I'm wondering, you know, Mark, who only tells us at the cross that the women had been there from the beginning. Thank you very much, Mark. So then you got to go put them back in. Um, do you put them back in at the supper as well? Um, who do you imagine is there and what are all these different people thinking? So not only can we speculate on what Jesus was thinking, we can also speculate on what Peter is thinking. Peter, who said when Jesus says, you know, I, I, the son of man has to be turned over and will eventually die. And Peter says, God forbid. Right. What's Peter thinking? And is he remembering what he said to Jesus back in Caesarea Philippi? Um, what are the other disciples? Are they worried that they're going to get arrested, too? We're, who's who's sheltering them, right? Mary and Martha running the intake. We don't know. That uh, the Last Supper. I mean, is that a is that a Passover? I've been I've been to 
Jewish homes for Passover, and it is one, that's a one hell of a party. <laughs> it is a party. It's a great it's time, a and it goes on at length, and it's just, it's, it's tremendous joy. And, and so right. I've also been to Christian seders, which are dull, uh, <laughs> not terribly tasty, right? Big, 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 mistake. The Jews. big mistake, yes. Yeah. So what was that last supper? Well, Mark makes it very clear it's a Passover seder, um, and he says, go prepare the Passover. Well, the Greek is Pascha, that means the Passover lamb. So go get the lamb from the temple, right? Which means he's still got a temple connection. Temple's still functioning. Um, you go get the lamb from the temple and you find a place because it's Passover time. So you got to rent a room, um, which is what the upper room is. It's, it's a rental place. We know about these. You could rent a room for a dinner and then get, get it catered or you could prepare the, the food yourself. Um, if it is a Passover Seder, um, then they're talking about freedom because you have to talk about freedom. And you have to talk about a move from getting out of slavery and getting into something new or getting into the promised whatever. In the Gospel of John, it's not a Passover Seder. Why? Because Jesus is the Passover offering. So, John, you have a sense of kind of replacement of the temple um, with Jesus being both the Passover offering, as John the Baptist says in, in John, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Passover offering is not a sin offering, by the way, but it is a protection from death offering. Because that original Passover lamb, you took the blood and you put it on your doorpost. Jews aren't doing this, by the way. You can't go to a Jewish house and say, oh, look, blood on the doorpost. That was a one-off. Ah. Um, but ah. but it's, it, it's still a sense of, of freedom. That preaches. Uh, absolutely. So the, the uh, last odd question, I think. Uh, so Jesus spends the night arrested. He's tried crowd hollers that that became a big anti-semitic thing right because the the crowd the jewish crowd his blood be on us and on our children which i think has a profound kind of meaning but then through the middle ages that was like right. the jews killed Matthew, jesus right. and Matthew 27, 25 the blood cry anti-semitic just terrible stuff anyway so then then jesus whoever but besides there, but james it's not only terrible it's a weird thing for a crowd to say like on cue you come up with that one Together that's in unison, like right? somebody passed yeah. out a sheet. Say this is crazy. Yeah, right. So that's Matthew. Uh, so anyway, he dies and he's buried, and then sat the Sabbath comes and goes where nothing happens. Then Easter morning, we had this thing. Our uh, friend and colleague that we went to school with, Dale Allison, uh, brilliant, smart well-read always, uh, has a new book out about the resurrection. He sort of weighs every possible theory of what happened. And anyway, so as a Jewish scholar and admirer of Jesus, you know, what, what, what was Easter? What was it historically is different than what the Gospels tell us? Um, the, in the Gospel of Mark, these these kind of somewhat clueless women, they're heading to the tomb, going, yeah, I wonder who's going to roll the stole, stone away. It's not great planning. Um, and then they get there to anoint the body. But as we saw in that first supper, the body has already been anointed for burial. And they, they've got the wrong task and, and they don't believe in the resurrection because they're going to anoint a corpse. Um, I think the followers of Jesus experienced him alive. I see no reason why they would have made this up. Um can can people have such experiences? Absolutely. People people did back then uh, in pagan sources and Jewish sources and, and people do to this day. Um, generally, it doesn't make you change. I mean, I've seen Elvis twice on West End Avenue pumping gas at Mapco, but, you know, and he's dead. Uh, but I didn't Are change. You sure? Are you sure sure. about this? Somebody's going to be unhappy about this now that Elvis. You're sure uh, he has left the building. Um, <laughs> no, and, I, but it didn't change my life. But these yeah. people who saw Jesus, it changed their life. So I, I think the, the better question is not, could you catch it on a camera? Because we don't know. Historians can't do that. Um, but can you see what, what the payoff is? Can you see what the result is? And here you can see what the result is. When it comes to me, I just wrote a book about miracles. So I've been thinking about miracles a lot. Um, I do not have a chapter on the resurrection, but I have a chapter on Je chapters on Jesus' miracles. Um, things happen that we can't explain. Um, and I'm not interested in either making a historical argument for the resurrection or making an historical argument against it. And I can do both. I find that I find both apologists and professional atheists to be boring. Um, 
And I'm much, much more interested not in the what exactly happened, but what were the effects of what happened? Or what were the effects of what people thought happened? I think that's a better question. You see the ghost of your father. Does it change how you act? You experience a hand on your shoulder and you realize when you feel that hand that there's enormous peace there. And you think, that was that was St. Francis, or that was Joan of Arc, um, or that was Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, and I felt it. I'm not going to tell you you're wrong, but I'm, I am going to say, now that you've had this experience, what are you going to do next? Yeah, or is there a, uh, I think how to put it, uh, a holy continuity between the stuff Jesus was about and then how you're changed because of a sense of his resurrection, right? You know, loads of horrible, Dale does this in this book, horrible people throughout Christianity who would say not only they believe in the resurrection of Jesus, they're doing what they're doing because of that. And it's bad behavior, violence, and so on. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard walked the streets of Copenhagen. He asked people, do you believe Jesus risen from the dead? And they're like, yeah, it made no difference, right? So maybe is there a holy continuity between that sense and how people actually live after that? Yeah, yeah Luke suggests that there is, um, if we can believe the first couple of chapters of Acts from which we've only got Luke's evidence. And Luke is clearly writing history in a way that, that will work for like a second century Christian audience. Um, it, did they have a sense of hope that they didn't have before? Did they think that the general resurrection of the dead was about to happen? Clearly Paul thinks Jesus is coming back like a week from Tuesday, yeah. right? At least when he was writing first Thessalonians. So how do you live if you think the reign of God is about to break in? Um, I think part, part of what Jesus was doing and I say this on my book in the Sermon on the Mount, is he's teaching people how to live as if they've got one foot in the kingdom already. Mm -hmm. Well, now you're a little bit closer. You can shift your weight a little bit. You're even closer to that kingdom. You're living into it. Now what do you do? And I think the early followers of Jesus substantially did that. Um, I also think they were manifesting various signs. I think they were speaking in tongues. I think they were doing healing ceremonies. I think they were practicing exorcism, just as Jesus did. I think they were setting up kinship groups where if you didn't have a family, they would take you in. And the people there would be your, your mother and brother and sister. I think that's fabulous. Yeah. Oh. Oh, all right, AJ, thank you. You're so good at uh, explaining things, opening our minds, uh, helping us reimagine what seems uh, familiar and a little tried and true. Uh, so you're fabulous. Thank you so much for being with us again. Always happy to talk with you. Um, I shall be in Ann Arbor on Wednesday when you are in Nashville, so I shall miss you. Oh, there we are. Um, but safe travels. Thanks, AJ. You take